Much of macroeconomics is devoted to understanding the behavior of aggregate output, prices, and unemployment. Today, you'll learn the meaning and measurement of the most important macroeconomic statistics. First, gross domestic product. Second, the consumer price index. And third, the unemployment rate. Let's start with gross domestic product. You can define it as either one total expenditure on domestically produced final goods and services or two total income earned by domestically located factors of production. By the way, what are the factors of production? The factors of production are land, labor, capital, human capital, and entrepreneurship. Here, expenditure equals income because every dollar spent by a buyer becomes income to the seller. This is well depicted by the circular flow diagram. As you can see in this simple circular flow diagram, households provide factors of production such as labor, and firms utilize the factors of production to produce goods that it sells to households. So the real thing goes one direction in blue, in return to the labor the household provides, firms pay salaries to the household that becomes the income to the households. And with the income household receives, the households buy goods the firms produce. So that becomes revenue to firms. So as you see, there's a circle that goes around in green, that is the dollar amounts. So you can see here that expenditure of the households eventually equals income to the households because every dollar spent by a buyer becomes income to the seller in both factor markets and goods markets. Now let's define another important concept, value added. Value added is defined as the value of output minus the value of the intermediate goods used to produce that output. For example, that output could be computers. So the value of the computers minus value of the intermediate goods such as computer chips and motherboards, etc used to produce that output becomes the value added for the computer manufacturer. Now let's try this question on value added. And here is the scenario. At first stage, a farmer grows a bushel of wheat and sells it to a miller for $1. And second stage, the miller turns the wheat into flour and sells it to a baker for $3. And the third stage is the baker using the flour to make a loaf of bread and sells it to an engineer for $6. And finally, last stage is the engineer eating the bread. And the question will be like this. Compute value added at each stage of production, and then compute GDP, assuming these are the only transactions in the economy. So at the first stage, the farmer's value added should be equal to $1, that is, the price of the wheat the farmer sells. So the value added for farmers is $1. And at the second stage, the miller turns the wheat into flour and sells it to a baker for $3. So here the value of output, that is the value of flour, is $3. And the value of the intermediate good, that is the wheat, is $1. So the miller's value added should equal to $3 minus $1, which is equal to $2. And at the third stage, the baker uses the flour to make a loaf of bread and sells it to an engineer for $6. So in this case, the value of output for baker is a loaf of bread, which is equal to $6. Minus the value of the intermediate good in this case is the flour, which is $3. Therefore, the value added for baker is $6 minus $3 equals to $3. And finally, at the last stage, the engineer eats the bread. So at each stage, at the first stage, then, the farmer's value added is $1. At the second stage, the miller's value added is $2. And at the third stage, the baker's value added is $3. And you can get the GDP out of when you sum all these three stages of value added. That is, $1 plus $2 plus $3 will give you $6, which is apparently equal to the final price of the bread. So one lesson you can get is this. The GDP should equal the value of the final goods, and that should also equal to the sum of the value added at all stages of production. Even though the problem we just solved is highly simplified, its main lesson holds in the real world. So GDP should equal to the value of final goods produced and should equal to the sum of value added at all stages of production.
And note that the value of the final goods already includes the value of the intermediate goods. So including intermediate and final goods in the GDP together would be double counting. So you have to be careful when you measure a GDP for an economy. Next, with these notes, now let's look at the expenditure components of GDP. In an open economy, there are four components of GDP. One, consumption. Two, investment. Three, government spending and for net exports. So we can define GDP as total expenditure on final goods and services, and that should equal to C plus I plus G plus net export. And those portions are known as aggregate expenditure. And an important identity is Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus net export. So left-hand side of the equation is the value of total output. So we can also define GDP as the value of aggregate output of final goods and services. And that should equal to total expenditure on final goods and services or aggregate expenditure on the right hand side of the equation or identity. And now let's look at each of these components. First, consumption or consumer spending. Consumption is defined as the value of all goods and services bought by households, including one, durable goods, which lasts a long time, for example, cars, and other home appliances. And two, non-durable goods, which last a short time, for example, food and clothing. And three, services, that is, work done for consumers or intangible items purchased by consumers, for example, dry cleaning, air travel, housing services, that is, the rent. However, note that consumer spending on a new house count under investment category. And in national income accounting, the services category of consumption includes the imputed rental value of owner-occupied housing. So here you can think of houses as a piece of capital producing housing services. And this table shows U.S. consumption in 2018 and divide the consumption into three components. So the total consumption in 2018, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, was 13.9987 trillion dollars and as a percent of total GDP that was approximately 68.02 percent of GDP and durables consisted 7.17 percent of GDP which was approximately equal to 1.4756 trillion dollars and non-durables were 14.04 percent of GDP which is equal to approximately 2.8892 trillion dollars in services 46.81% which was approximately 9.6339 trillion dollars respectively and as you can see US consumption is roughly two thirds of the US GDP and among them services category counts most which is approximately little less than half of US GDP was services category of the consumption now the second expenditure component of the GDP is the aggregate investment or investment, which is the total spending on newly produced capital goods. For example, if I pay $1,000 for a used PC for my business, then I am doing $1,000 of investment, but the seller does $1,000 of disinvestment, therefore no net impact on GDP when you purchased used PC for example. So that's why it's the total spending on newly produced capital goods that count as the aggregate investment. So it's the spending on capital goods that is a physical asset used in future production. This includes one, business fixed investment that is spending on plant and equipment. Two, residential fixed investment that is spending by consumers and landlords on housing units, so spending on housing. And three, inventory investment, which is the change in the value of all firms' inventories. For example, let's say inventory at year one was, let's say, $10 billion. And if inventory year two was equal to $12 billion, then changes in inventory should equal to $12 billion minus $10 billion, which is equal to $2 billion. So that change would be counted as inventory investment as plus $2 billion. This table shows the U.S. investment in 2018, and it divides into three components that are business fixed, residential, and inventory. So here, the aggregate investment was equal to 
3.6283 trillion dollars. That was approximately 17.63% of GDP. And among investment category, the business fixed consists the largest, that was $2.7869 trillion, which was equal to approximately 13.54% of GDP. And then residential fixed investment was approximately $786.7 billion, which was approximately 3.82% of GDP. And inventory investment was positive $54.7 billion, which was approximately 0.27% of GDP. So note that positive inventory investment means the change in inventory was greater than zero in 2018. That is, there was increase in inventory versus 2017 in the U.S. in 2018. The third expenditure component of GDP is the government spending, G. And here G includes all government spending on goods and services. However, G excludes transfer payments, for example, unemployment insurance payments, because they do not represent spending on goods and services, because people who receive transfer payments use these funds to pay for their consumption, and we avoid double counting by excluding transfer payment from G. This table shows the U.S. government spending in 2018 which was roughly $3.5915 trillion, which was approximately 17.45% of GDP, which is roughly one-sixth of GDP. And you can divide government spending into two major categories. That is one federal and then state and local or municipal governments. And federal consisted $1.3473 trillion, which was approximately 6.55% of GDP. And federal divides into big two categories, that is non-defense versus defense categories. And non-defense was approximately $553.7 billion. That was approximately 2.69% of GDP. And defense was $793.6 billion, which was approximately 3.86% of GDP. And state and local, that is municipal government spending, were approximately $2.2442 trillion, which was approximately equal to 10.90% of GDP in 2018. Finally, the last expenditure component is net export, which is equal to exports minus imports. So here exports are equal to the value of goods and services sold to other countries, and imports are the value of goods and services purchased from other countries. Hence, net export equals net spending from abroad on our goods and services. This table shows U.S. net exports in 2018. And if you look at the net exports figure of goods and services, you see that's negative $638.2 billion, which is, as a percent of GDP, negative 3.10% of GDP. That's a significant negative. That means because net export equals exports minus imports, export should have been less than imports. So as you can see in this table, exports was equal to 2.510. $3 trillion, which was approximately 12.20% of GDP, while imports were $3.1485 trillion, which was approximately 15.30% of GDP. So definitely there's a big gap between exports and imports, and we call that trade deficit. But then if you divide into components of goods and services, you notice that if you compare goods export versus goods imports, there's even more gap between them, while if you compare services exports and services imports, actually you have positive net service exports. That is $848.9 billion minus $577.9 billion would be approximately equal to $200. $71 billion of positive net export of services. That means there's a huge amount of trade deficit in goods. So if you subtract from $1.6613 trillion of goods exports, 
2.5706 trillion dollars of goods imports, you have negative 909.3 billion dollars of goods trade balance. That means 909.3 billion dollars of goods trade deficit. So as you divide these into components, you could see that huge amount of net exports of goods and services deficit mainly came from huge amount of negative net exports of goods. In fact, we had positive net exports of services. And one thing I want to note is that because you have negative 3.1% as a share of GDP of net exports, that means if you sum consumption, investment, and government spending together, it will add up to more than 100% of GDP. That is the demand side. So there's going to be 3.1% extra you need to get and that's not produced domestically and they are on the net imported from abroad now let's look at this problem suppose a firm produces 10 million dollars worth of final goods but only sells 9 million dollars worth question is does this violate the expenditure equals output identity the answer is no because unsold output actually goes into inventory and is counted as inventory investment whether or not the inventory buildup was intentional. So, in effect, we are assuming that firms purchase their unsold output, therefore you have this balance of output equals expenditure at the end. We have now seen that GDP measures total income, total output, and total expenditure and it is the sum of value added at all stages in the production of final goods therefore you will see that we use them and gdp interchangeably throughout the course now let's regurgitate these gdp is the value of all final goods and services produced and nominal gdp measures these values using current prices while real gdp measures these values using the prices of a base year. You have learned this in principles class, so this part would be like a review for you. Now let's try to solve these problems. Very simple problems. That is, compute nominal GDP and compute the real GDP in each year using 2016 as the base year. And you have three years value of goods, that is, of the prices and quantity of goods A and B in this simple economy 2016 17 18 accordingly in the table and this will be a review for you so it's pretty easy and simple so here when you calculate nominal gdp you use the formula of summing each of the two goods the values that is produced nominal dollar terms and when you calculate real gdp you're basically summing the values of two goods a and b in real that is the base year price terms so how do you solve it? Nominal GDP for 2016, for instance, would be equal to sum of the value of goods produced in 2016 in terms of 2016 price and quantity. So that is equal to $30 times $900. That's the value of good A in current dollars plus $100 times 192, which would be the value of good B produced in 2016. You sum them up it should get $46,200 as the nominal GDP. And since the base year is 2016 here, the real GDP is identical as nominal GDP as $46,200. But they would differ for 2017 and 18 between them. For instance, nominal GDP in 2017 would be equal to $31 times 1,000 plus $102 times 200, which would add up to 51,400 while real GDP in 2017 will be equal to using base year price but 2017 quantity so $30 times 1000 plus $100 times 200 which will give you $50,000 as real GDP for 2017. Finally for 2018 the nominal GDP would be equal to 36 times 1050 plus 100 times 205, which is equal to 58,300, while real GDP should equal to the base year prices times 2018 quantities, so 
30 dollars times 1050 plus 100 times 205 which will give you 52,000 dollars as real GDP. So from this exercise we just went over, we could tell that changes in nominal GDP can be due to both changes in prices and changes in quantities are often produced. However, the changes in real GDP can only be due to changes in quantities because real GDP is constructed using constant base year prices. So from our previous example, you could see that the percent change in real GDP from 2017 to 18 should equal to 52,000 minus 50,000 over 50,000 times 100. That should equal to 4%. While percent change in nominal GDP from 2017 to 2018 should equal to 58,300 minus 51,400 over 51,400 times 100, which is approximately equal to 13.42%. So as you could see that nominal GDP increased by 13.42%, but real GDP increased by 4% only. This implies that increase in nominal GDP is largely due to increase in prices. And in real term, actual growth, it was only 4% increase. That's why we want to use, instead of nominal GDP, the real GDP as a proxy for the real value of GDP and GDP growth. Now let's look at this plot. This plot is plotting two figures. One is real GDP and the other is nominal GDP from 1960 to 2014 for the United States. So here the red is the real GDP in 2009 dollars and the blue is nominal GDP. Notice here that the nominal GDP rises relatively faster than the real GDP. That is the steeper slopes of the nominal GDP relative to the real GDP. Why? Because price in general increased overall over time. So price level increased generally over time. And also notice in 2009 these two plots cross. What is the significance of it? Probably you notice that's the base year. So prior to 2009, the base year, the real GDP was larger than nominal GDP. That means dollars were worth more before. Whereas after 2009, the reverse, the nominal GDP is larger than real GDP. So dollars worth less than before. So in the base year, both nominal GDP and real GDP should be the same. And you could have seen that from our previous example. So graphically, that's represented by the point where these two plots cross. When we talk about rising price level, we're dealing with inflation rate, which is the percentage increase in the overall level of prices. And there are several measures of the overall price level. And one measure of the price level is the GDP deflator. And it is used to deflate or remove the effects of inflation from GDP and other economic variables. And GDP deflator is defined as 100 times nominal GDP over real GDP. Or when you normalize to one, sometimes just nominal GDP over real GDP. As the difference is convention, in our textbook, we may use nominal GDP over real GDP. But most of the times, we indexed as 100 as benchmark, so we use this formula in general. So when you do your homework, sometimes the launchpad may use 1 as the benchmark. In that sense, sometimes the question choice might give you like decimals versus 1. And you can sense the proportion, so when the choices are not like 100s or 90s, but instead 1 or 0.9 or 1.2, then based on that, you would figure out the formula the textbook used was nominal GDP over real GDP versus some other times when the choices are 100 or 90 or 120, then means this formula is used. So use your discretion to figure out the differences. Now based on previous exercise, calculate first GDP deflators for 2016, 17, and 18. And based on that, you can use GDP deflator as the proxy for price level we can calculate inflation rate for 2017 and 18. For 2016, because there's no 2015 GDP deflator variable, inflation rate cannot be calculated. But you can calculate inflation rate for 2017 and 18 with respect to the previous years. So the GDP deflator for 2016, for instance, should equal to what? Yes, it should equal to 100 for the base year because nominal GDP and real GDP are the same. So 100 times 1 equals 100. On the other hand, for 2017, nominal GDP we calculated was 51,400. 
and Rio was 50,000. Therefore, nominal over Rio would give you 51,400 over 50,000 times 100 will give you 102.8. And finally, in 2018, the GDP deflator should equal to nominal over Rio, so 58,300 over 52,000 times 100, which is approximately equal to 112.115. And based on these numbers you fill out as GDP deflator, you can calculate inflation rate for 2017 as 102.8 minus 100 over 100 times 100, which is going to be 2.8%. And for 2018, that should be equal to 112.115 minus 102.8 divided by 102.8 times 100, which will give you approximately 9.1% as inflation rate. Before we move on to additional topics, let's go through math. So let's go over these math. These are handy arithmetic tricks which will be useful in the future in many different contexts. And for small changes in time, for any values x and y, the percent change in x times y should be approximately equal to percent change in x plus percent change in y. So I'll prove this roughly during our Zoom session, our live lecture. And if we utilize this very simple trick, you can answer this question very quickly. That is, if your hourly wage rises 5% and your work and you work 7% more hours, then your wage income rises approximately 12%. Why? Because wage income should equal to wage rate times the amount of time you work, labor hours. So here, instead of X and Y, you have wage rate and work hours, and wage income should equal to then wage rate times work hours. And percent change, basically, of wage income should equal to approximately percent change in wage rate plus percent change in work hours. Therefore, approximately, your wage income rises by 5% change in hourly wage plus 7% change in work hours. Therefore, approximately 12% change in wage income. So this is a very neat trick you can have to quickly calculate these percent changes. But this only holds for small changes in percents. So if you actually use if you have large numbers of changes like 50% and 70% changes, then this approximation doesn't work. But it only works to a certain level of small changes in terms of percent changes of these variables x and y that will lead to approximately percent change in x times y. The second trick is this. Percent change in x over y should be approximately equal to percent change in x minus percent change in y. So I can also show this during a uh, Zoom session, how this holds so. But if you use this trick, you can actually calculate this. That is, if GDP deflator formula is 100 times nominal GDP over real GDP, and if nominal GDP rises 9%, then real GDP rises 4%, then here, percent change in X would be 9%, minus percent change in Y would be 4%, therefore, the percent change in x over y, this is percent change in GDP deflator, should be equal to approximately 9% minus 4%, that is 5%. And I'll explain during Zoom session why that 100 disappears from this formula. Now, let me briefly note on the chain-weighted real GDP. Over time, relative prices change. So the base year should be updated periodically. So in 1995, the Bureau of Economic Analysis introduced a new policy of using so-called chain-weighted real GDP. And I don't want to get deeply into it, but in essence, chain-weighted real GDP updates the base year every year. So it is more accurate than constant price GDP. That is, Average prices, let's say in 2017 and 18, are used to measure real growth from, let's say, uh, from 2017 to 18, and from 2018 and 19, and from 2019 and 20, and so on. So that makes it uh, more accurate. However, your textbook usually uses constant price real GDP because, one, the two measures are highly correlated, and two, constant price real GDP is easier to compute. So we are not going to get into the detail of the chain-weighted real GDP in this class.
Now, next measure of the overall price level is the Consumer Price Index, CPI, which is published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS. So, what are its uses? Basically, CPI tracks changes in the typical household's cost of living, adjusts many contracts for inflation, or the COLAs, or cost of living adjustments, and allows comparisons of dollar amounts over time. So how does the BLS construct the CPI? Basically, if one, they survey consumers to determine composition of the typical consumer's basket of goods, and two, every month collect data on prices of all items in the basket and compute cost of basket, and three, the CPI in any month now equals this 100 times cost of basket in that month over cost of basket in base period. So, for instance, the CPI in 2017 should equal to cost of basket in 2017 over cost of basket in the base year times 100. Now, let's try this exercise to regurgitate this. So, let's assume there are 20 pizzas and 10 compact discs in the basket in a typical household in this economy. And the prices of pizzas and CDs are given as below in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, respectively. And the question is, for each year, compute the cost of basket first, and then the CPI using 2017 as the base year, and the inflation rate from the preceding year. So how do you calculate cost of basket for each year? Basically, the cost of basket should equal to, for each year, price of pizza times 20 pizzas plus price of CDs times 10 CDs for each year, for 2017. For example, price of pizza, which is $10 times 20 pizzas plus price of CDs, $15 times 10 CDs. And that will give you 2017 cost of basket as 350. And you can use the same method to calculate 2018, 19, 20 cost of basket. And once you calculate those, then you use those cost of basket using CPI formula with a saw to calculate CPI for each of the years. And if you use those formulas, you could have these numbers. So these are the answers, the cost of baskets for each of the four years. And CPI is based on the formula you use to calculate for each year. And then inflation rate is going to be percent change in CPIs from one year to the next year. So that's going to be 5.7% uh, from 2017 to 18, 8.1% from 2018 to 19, and then 2.5% from 2019 to 20. So note that whenever you calculate inflation rate, you're using previous periods proxy for price level. So you use previous year CPI number to calculate the percent change in prices or CPIs as a measure of inflation rate for each of the years, as you see here. This pie chart shows the composition of the CPI's basket, and each number is the percent of the typical household's total expenditure. And this data was based on BLS data from December 2014. And you can see the breakdown here. So the food and beverages, approximately 15.1%, housing, approximately 41.9%, apparels, 3.5%, transportation, 15.7%, medical care, 7.7%, recreation, 5.7%, education, 3.3%, communication, 3.7%, and other goods and services, 3.4%, respectively. So this is the typical urban household, typical household's basket. Then the question probably comes to you, because probably if I ask you the question, how does your breakdown of your own expenditure differ from that of the typical household shown here? You say definitely about education, for instance. You would probably spend a lot more on education than this typical household, for instance. How might then the typical elderly person's expenditure differ from this figure shown here? And the answer is probably the medical care spending. Probably the elderly spend a much larger fraction 
of their income on medical care, a category in which prices grow much faster than the CPI. So if you find out that if CPI is used to give social security colas to the elderly, you would say that's not fair because that would understate the increase in price level that elderly face because recently we found a lot more increase in prices of medical care than other components of the basket and elderly spend a much larger fraction of it. So when you use COLA for social security for elderly, just using typical CPI is not a right one to use, then they have to consider this fact. Therefore, it is important for them to reflect the price level changes for elderly spending. Many economists believe that the CPI may overstate inflation. And there are three major biases. One, substitution bias. The CPI uses fixed weights, so it cannot reflect consumers' ability to substitute toward goods whose relative prices have fallen. Therefore, the true cost of living standard may increase less rapidly in that case. So that's the one source of this bias. And second is the introduction of new goods bias, also known as new product bias. That is, the introduction of new goods makes consumers better off and in effect increases the real value of the dollar. But it does not reduce the CPI because the CPI uses fixed weights. That is, there's value of greater variety that this is not reflected. And finally, there's unmeasured changes in quality bias. There's increase in quality bias, that is. That is, quality improvements increase the value of the dollar, but are often not fully measured. For example, computers and TVs, etc. So computing power has increased so much, so the computer you had 10 years before is not the same computer you have now, for example. And the TV you had 10 years before is not the same TV you have now. Therefore, the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually added quality adjustments for PCs in 1998 and TVs in 1999, for example, to reflect these changes in quality. So, in 1995, a Senate-appointed panel of experts estimated that the CPI overstates inflation by about 1.1% per year. So, the BLS made adjustments to reduce the bias. For example, BLS update the market basket every two years rather than every 10 years, and this will lower substitution and new product biases. And also, the BLS has used statistical methods to reduce the size of the quality biases. So, after these adjustments, now the CPI's bias is probably under 1% per year now. Now, let's go through three key differences between CPI and the GDP deflator. And the first difference between the CPI and the GDP deflator is that the prices of capital goods that firms buy are included in GDP deflator if produced domestically, but excluded from CPI because CPI includes only consumption. Second, the prices of imported consumer goods are included in CPI, for example, Japanese cars, but excluded from GDP deflator. Finally, the basket of goods for CPI is fixed versus GDP deflator, it changes every year. So the third difference between CPI and the GDP deflator comes from the way the two measures sum up the prices of the basket of goods. And the CPI assigns fixed weights and focuses on the cost of buying a base year bundle, that is using baskets of base year, and this do not allow the substitution away from the product when price increases. And these kinds of indexes are known as so-called last payers index, which tend to overstate inflation. On the other hand, a GDP deflator is a type of index known as a PASC index or PASC index. That is a price index with a changing basket. So GDP deflator case, the weights change, and this will understate inflation. And this focuses on the cost of buying the current year's bundle. And it allows and reflects the substitution. And it does not reflect the reduction in consumers' welfare that may result from such substitution. And it is assumed that the individual will buy the current year bundle in the base year. Therefore, this will overstate the cost of the base year bundle 
the denominator in the ratio that is and will cause the index itself to be understated it understates the impact of rising prices because facing base years prices consumers would have been able to achieve the same level of utility at a lower cost by changing their consumption bundle so it overstates the cost of the base year bundle now let's look at this plot of the two measures of the inflation in the United States, that is the CPI in red and the GDP deflator in blue. And as you notice, in 1980, the CPI increased much faster than the GDP deflator, probably because the CPI includes or reflected the oil price changes abroad more than the GDP deflator. And next point is 2009. That is, while the GDP deflator showed positive inflation, in 2009, the CPI briefly showed slightly negative inflation. So since 1960, that's the only time we had any sign of deflation, only reflected through CPI, but not through GDP deflator. But overall, it seems like, in general, they move pretty much together. Finally, let's consider the measurement of unemployment. And the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, calculates the unemployment rate and other labor statistics based on results from the current population survey of about 60,000 households, known as the Household Survey. And now let's define a few terms so that we can use these terms to actually derive a formula and calculate different measures, important measures related to unemployment. First, we define employed. Let's call it letter E as working at a paid job, unemployed, letter U, for not employed but looking for a job, then you can name labor force, let's say L, equals to E plus U, that is the amount of labor available for producing goods and services, which is equal to all employed plus unemployed persons. And we can define not in the labor force as being equal to other population minus labor force. Those are not employed, not looking for work. In the United States, side note, other population are the people 16 and over. And the two important labor force concepts are one, unemployment rate, and two, labor force participation rate. And unemployment rate is the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed, and that should equal to unemployed over labor force times 100 as a percentage. Similarly, labor force participation rate which is the fraction of the adult population that participates in the labor force, that is the working or looking for work, should equal to labor force over adult population times 100 for percent measure. Now, based on those information, let's try to compute these statistics. That is labor force, the number of people not in the labor force, the labor force participation rate, and the unemployment rate. First, the labor force. What is labor force equals to? Labor force equals to number of employed plus number of unemployed. So the labor force equals to 156.7 plus 6.5 equals to 163.2 million. Next, the number of people not in the labor force should equal to other population minus labor force. So the population is 258.2 million. And labor force you found as 163.2 million. So 258.2 minus 163.2 should equal to 95 million at the end. And the labor force participation rate should equal to labor force divided by adult population times 100. So that's equal to 163.2 over 258.2 times 100, which is equal to approximately 63.2%. Finally, the unemployment rate is equal to number of unemployed over labor force times 100, which is equal to 6.5 over 163.2 times 100, and that's approximately equal to 3.98% unemployment rate. In addition to asking households about their employment status, the Bureau of Labor Statistics obtains a second measure of employment by surveying businesses, asking how many workers are on their payrolls. And neither measure is perfect and they occasionally diverge due to one, 
treatment of self-employed persons, and two, new firms not counted in establishment survey, and three, technical issues involving population inferences from sample data. And this graph shows the percentage change in the total U.S. non-farm employment from 12 months earlier from two surveys, that is the household survey, that's in orange, and the establishment survey, that's in purple. And as you see, in general, they look like they move closely together, even though there might be some deviations due to the reasons I just mentioned. But in general, they closely move together.